Good morning. Uh, so talk about being real and being messy. How about have the person who has the learned behavior of conflict avoidance doing a passage on conflict and dealing with it? Um, so, yeah, I grew up in a home where there were lots of landmines and things just would escalate if you hit the wrong one on the wrong day. And so my way, my learned behavior, which I think I've taken in a positive direction, was to bring the tension down with humor. That's why uh, you get lots of depressed comedians, because they actually learned that skill in a harsh way, right? It's like that was their way of coping, their way of dealing, bringing down the tension. And, and in my home, conflict didn't lead to resolution. It just would get pressed down for a bit until you stepped on one of those landmines. Kaboom! Then everything is out again, big and bad. And that's one of Paul's concerns, um, is not dealing with the conflict, not dealing with issues between people in this uh, passage. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the first part of the passage, but first I want to give you a little uh, insight into Paul in general um, and his way of using terms, because it's, it comes up anywhere in Paul, but we've already heard these terms ag again and again in Corinthians. Paul, um, there are different metaphors for talking, for talking about the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. And he'll use these metaphors regularly, but if, if you don't know kind of how he's using them, we can misread them. So one of the big, big ones is being of the spirit or spirit and flesh. So being of the spirit, that gets translated spiritual. But in our common parlance, that can kind of be this ethereal thing that we don't really know what it means. But when Paul uses the word and calls them, uh, are you not spiritual? or you think of yourselves as spiritual, always think of it as of the Spirit with a capital S. So are you not indwelt, empowered by the Spirit? Or are you still living according to the ways of the world or according to the flesh? And the fle flesh just becomes this contrast of spirit is intangible, breath, wind, and flesh is <laughs> tangible, but when he says flesh, he doesn't mean, uh, as a Jewish person, he doesn't, he's not like the Greeks where they actually denigrated the material world and didn't think of it as, as something uh, good. Flesh for him is that which is over against the spirit. So it's that which is in conflict. So the way of the flesh is the way of the world. So that's one of the things you, you need to hear. Uh, another one is uh, he'll use the dichotomy to talk about the people. So the saints versus the unrighteous or those without faith. The saints is uh, how in English the holy ones has been translated. So those who are holy versus those who are not holy. And that holiness comes from a relationship with Christ. Another one, um, and this will be most relevant to this text today, is, and, and Jesus did this too, is those on the inside and those on the outside. So inside the kingdom and the world out there um, in contrast to the kingdom of God. So that's going to be important because in this first section uh, that we're reading, Paul is concerned about what's going on on the inside, what's going on on the church uh, with brothers and sisters uh, fighting with each other, and this seems to be some form of like uh, what we would think of in terms of litigation. There's probably, it seems like there's some kind of financial thing going on here, but he calls these trivial matters. These are small things which somewhere in this community there should be at least one wise person that can help you do this. And if not, 
for the sake of the community, if you're the one that's been defrauded, can't you just take a step back and go, this is trivial, this isn't as important as I'm making it out to be. But certainly don't go outside and have someone who, uh, some of the translations will make it kind of a legalese term, who has no standing in the church, but literally it's to those who actually despise the church. You're going to go to someone who despises the church. You're going to have your fight in front of them. You're going to let them decide between you. Is there no one in your community that you can trust? Or can you be like Christ and go, I'll, I'll take the little bit of suffering, uh, the financial suffering, the hardship, um, and we'll just settle it and I'll let it go. And his concern partly is that what does this communicate to, to the world. If you're supposed to be drawing people into your community and you can't handle your little squabbles, then what is that saying to the wider world, the world outside, the very people that you actually want to reach and draw in? Now, I think this text can be abused, as a lot of Scripture can be, because it can be used to make someone who is a victim <laughs> continue in to be a victim. So Paul is talking here about trivial issues, issues that you would take to court, right? So a, a, a simple, he's not talking about egregious sin, right? And we know that because it's very important to read everything in context. We know that because in chapter 5, which is right before this, he talks about uh, a man who's in a relationship, a sexual relationship with his stepmom, and uh, because the man won't repent, won't end this relationship, Paul says, look, I've spoken about this, we've addressed this, he's not changing, it's time to put that man out. And the language he uses is, it is time to hand him over to Satan. Now here is another important thing. So how many of you, when you heard Satan, got a picture of like pitchfork devil or whatever? Um, <laughs> when Scripture uses the term Satan, especially in the, in the New Testament period, they mean the kingdoms of this world. There's only two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. All the way back in Genesis, remember, it's the serpent who tempts them with a different form of ruling, a different type of kingdom. Oh, did God say not to eat of that tree or anything in the garden? He tricks and deceives and gets them to serve an alternate kingdom. And that's the way Paul is thinking. It's like, okay, he's not contributing, and he's actually continuing to live this way. This is a very uh, typical biblical way of dealing things. If someone refuses to r repent, then let them continue down that path, and they will suffer in accordance to it, because once you go down a path, it, God does it all the time with the, the, the children of Israel in the wilderness. They complain, and he says, okay, I will give you what you want. And that's the, that's the punishment. <laughs> they get what they want. <laughs> and it's like, okay, you can have it. Um, and so Paul, when he's saying, there are times, there are things so egregious that we need to put them outside the church for their sake and the sake of the community. So this passage isn't about big things where someone is actually being harmed, because uh, I really think this passage can be used to, to keep people in, um, as a lot of scripture can be, <laughs> flipped around for what its intent is and actually made to continue abuse and, uh, and keep someone in a place of victimhood. So that's the, the easy part of our passage today. So one of the things that has really 
come to me, and I'm, I'm, the one song was really helpful for me today to kind of center me, that, you know, reminding that Christ is the firm foundation. Um, because when Shane asked me to, to preach, I'm like, I'm always like, that's my comfort zone. Yeah, I'll do it. And then I read the passage, and I'm like, ooh, now I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> um, so, but yesterday, I was comfortable again. And I want to talk about the word comfort. So comfort, uh, we get it through the Latin, um, confortare, which means together strong. You think of that when you hear comfort, or you think like pillows and things? <laughs> comfort, strong together. Or another translation would be to strengthen. If you comfort one another, you strengthen someone. Or it can mean support. So today I am quite confident that many people here are going to feel uncomfortable <laughs> with what I'm talking about. But my hope is that by the end you will feel comfortable again that is supported. Uh, so. I would tell my students, because when they're teaching at a um, university level and kids had to take a Bible class, uh, for a lot of, and unfortunately some of the professors made it a habit of knocking out pillars but not building up, I would tell my students, look, some of the things that you think are the pillars of your faith are going to get challenged as we dive deeply into Scripture. Some of the things that, that, that you think are so fundamentally important at, as we go through the text, some of those things, those pillars are going to be knocked over. They become fragile. And I would say, my intent isn't to knock out all the pillars. <laughs> my intent is to show you which ones are actually load-bearing. Right? So which ones are the real pillars of your faith, because those other ones, oh, they were there, but you find that, oh, if that one falls over, uh, my faith is still there, and you can actually see the true pillars more clearly. The other ones, it's like a reverse of seeing the trees for the forest. <laughs> I can't see the trees for the forest. It's like, well, there's a forest there. Well, what's the important tree? What tree am I looking for? Um, but... I'm pretty sure that some pillars are going to be shaken today, and my hope is that at the end you'll find out where the real supports are, and if you can't remember, we can just reprise that song, but Christ is the firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. So if nothing else, come back to that. The reason I say that is because um, we chose to read the message today, but that's not the usual text I go to. Um, it was translated by one of my professors. I go to another text where one of my professors was the head of the committee, the ESV. And this is what I read in that text. And here, I guarantee there's going to be some discomfort. So after he talks about dealing with things inside the church. And remember, um, coming back to some of the things that Shane said, that the Corinthian church, they think, oh, we're super spiritual and they're, we're kings, right? So this is why he's talking about the reigning with Christ. He's like, you guys are already calling yourselves kings and reigning and you can't even settle a little dispute? Well, let me tell you that you are going to reign one day, so maybe a little practice with these simple things before you have to make serious judgments. And then he brings in up, up some serious judgments, as he's indicated before. So, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 
and such were some of you. But you, uh, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You see how I, when I was reading over the passage that I was assigned, and I actually like being assigned passages, makes me look at things, that I read that first part, and I'm like, oh yeah, I can kind of see some things new, and then I went, oh, forgive my language, oh crap. <laughs> because uh, I am not going to avoid this. Uh, one of my concerns about the way this uh, previous passage can be understood, where the church deals with everything internally, is we have countless stories, countless history of the church keeping up appearances and making the vulnerable more vulnerable. And that is my big concern. So the truth and reconciliation, did you, I don't know if you guys know the, the history of that, but the first one was done in Chile, um, and it was based on the theology and philosophy of uh, Catholic theologian Jacques Maritain, uh, who also was the head of the committee that wrote the Declaration of Human Rights for the UN. But part of the concern there was, oh, we change regimes and everything just gets erased, right? We forget the past. Well, in Chile, and I, I don't know enough about current politics in Chile, but when they did their first truth, re truth and Reconciliation, the very first one ever, it was recognized that it was very important that the victims be heard, that the perpetrators of violence against those victims were able to express themselves and apologize so that they could build a new nation together without hiding everything that went in the past. But we all know that churches around the world hide abusers. Catholic Church, Protestants are no better. They just have a different way of moving predatory pastors around, right? They just move them to another, another location. The indigenous people, women, for centuries. <laughs> it's still not great. <laughs> um, anybody who's different. Um, slavery. It was the Sp Spain and Portugal and England, all Christian nations at the time. They were the ones kidnapping people from Africa and and then you had people quoting the Bible to defend it, right? So my concern is that this place, this community, be a place where all people feel supported, comforted. We don't make the vulnerable more vulnerable because that makes them targets for the predators. Now, let's move to this passage, because I was very um, uncomfortable and at the same time frustrated with this translation. Because one of the things that happens here, so this phrase, nor men who practice homosexuality. Remember, all Bible translations are also interpretations. So this is a translation of a Greek text. Interpreters are making interpretive decisions. What does this word mean? Oh, what does this word mean? This is actually two words. But they've said, hey, it is this phrase and it means this. And then I'm like, oh, at least they've got a footnote where they'll clarify that there's lots of dispute about what these words mean. So I go down to the footnote, and I wish I had my glasses. Um, Oh, my eyes aren't doing too bad. The two Greek terms translated by this phrase refer to the passive and active partners in consensual homosexual acts. I'm like, really? <laughs> Is that what those two words mean? Because the scholarly debate among biblical scholars and classical scholars say, we're not exactly sure what these words mean. 
In fact, Paul invented one of these words, it seems. At least, he is the, it's this text and 1 Timothy are the first extant uses of one of these terms. So the two terms in Greek that get translated into this phrase and every other translation that you have except the message is going to translate it as something like homosexuality or uh, in older translations, pervert. Um, they'll translate it buggerer. They're like, so all making that same jump. Well, the two terms are, the first one is malakoi. Everywhere else in the New Testament where that word is used, except for in these vice lists that Paul has, uh, it refers to something that is soft. So clothing, that's how it's used. So the leap then is made from soft, so if you're applying it to a male, then effeminate. And this would fit Greek culture as men, men were hard and women were squishy. Literally, women were malformed men in Greek culture, but he's not Greek, he's Jewish. So what does he mean by soft? Well, there's lots of debate about that. In other contexts, outside the New Testament, when you find this word, it means things like self-indulgent, gluttonous to the point of excess, right? So luxurious living, soft living, we still have that phrase. That is one of the possible translations here. Do they put that in the footnote? No, nope, they double down on this is what this means. The other term is uh, arsenicotoi. This is a compound word which, again, does not occur anywhere else before Paul. It does occur after Paul uses it. Um, it seems like it's possible that he's taking two terms from Leviticus 18 that deal with um, men shall not lie with other men as, with, as they do with a woman and combining two of the words from there to make a compound word. So literally translated, it is man liars, L-I-E-R-S. That would be the compound word he came up with. So there is something here possibly about homosexuality. Um, although, keep in mind, the term homosexuality only entered the English language after it was invented as a medical term in 1869 in Germany. So it's still a new word for us, relatively. Um, and we have different meanings when we're using it. Um, so what does this word mean? Well, elsewhere, um, outside the New Testament, it means something like, well, it can be used for economic exploiters, but often in the case of economic sexual exploiters. In other words, sex traffickers and pimps. We are in the Greco-Roman world here where pretty much every temple had temple prostitutes, right? That was part of worship. Uh, that was part of the idolatrous living that Paul is concerned about. And those temple prostitutes were not just female, they were also male. There was a lot of pederasty in the Greco-Roman world approved, right? So when you put these phrases together, and then in Timothy, right before this phrase, where Paul puts these two words together, it's enslavers, and then the malakoi and the arsenicotoi. So is it really about simply a same-sex act between two consensual men, if that was even a concept that Paul could have understood at his time from his perspective. Because most of our culture has only shifted to accepting that as a possibility in recent years. Oh, not even when I was a kid. 
and I'm not that old. <laughs> in the 70s, it was just assumed that if someone's sexual orientation was deviant, uh, that is, non-heterosexual, then therefore they would be deviant in all sorts of ways. But I hope that we have learned that that is not the case. And so I think Eugene Peterson has translated this very well when he says in his translation, uh, let me find it again. Don't you realize that this is not the way to live? Unjust people who don't care about God will not be joining in his kingdom. Those who use and abuse each other, use and abuse sex, use and abuse the earth and everything in it, don't qualify as citizens in, the, in God's kingdom. A number of you know from experience what I'm talking about. For not so long ago, you were on that list. Since then, you've been cleaned up and given a fresh start by Jesus, our Master, our Messiah, and by our God present in us, the Spirit. So, Eugene Peterson, making an interpretive translation choice, recognizes what I think, too, is Paul's intent, is we are concerned about abusers in the church, right? People who abuse one another, people uh, non-consensual sex, or, and this, this, frankly, this church should know that there are limits to what we will accept in terms of sexual relationships. Now, the question then becomes, for a lot of people, it's like, well, if you allow that, it's kind of like a, a slippery slope. I think Paul, one of the Paul possible translations for Mal, uh, Malakoy, that self-indulgence, is promiscuity. Right? So there are limits to what Christians are called to do and live in the church and to follow Christ and be part of the kingdom of God. But this text and other texts like it have been used to beat people down, to make vulnerable men and women more vulnerable, to put them because they can't open up, they can't talk about it, they can't in the lingo come out of the closet. <laughs> and therefore, we know that they become the targets of violent, predatory human beings. So can't the church be the sanctuary? Can't the church be the place that is the place of support and comfort where vulnerable, pe vulnerable people can come and feel comforted and safe and supported instead of condemned and pushed out as though they were outside the community? That's my desire for this place, and that means probably for some of us uh, challenging, difficult conversations. Um, it means getting to know people that you wouldn't necessarily uh, want to have gotten to know in the past. And bear in mind that my own journey in, in my thinking about this didn't come overnight. I've been on the exact opposite position. Um, but over time, uh, my theology I've been taught is uh, um, to use the Wesleyan quadrilateral. So scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Experience there, I include the, the activity of the spirit. So all those things come together to shape uh, one's theology, whether one acknowledges it or not. Carefully reading scripture, and in such a way that you're like, hmm, am I using this text to beat somebody down, or am I using them to give life, to build them up? And it's okay to question translations. <laughs> In this case, this would be hard to do because um, one of the first steps in looking at Bible translations, if you want to see if there's problems in the text, is 
to open up a bunch of different translations and see how they translate it. But in this, it's pretty consistent. But they mask a whole debate. They mask a whole other way of reading this, um, even if they put in a footnote, scholars disagree, and here are some other options. At least that would be there. But they didn't do that. None of the texts do that. The only one that goes a different way is the message by Eugene Peterson. Um, so I hope that I have helped you see that text in a different light. I hope that I have expressed what I think is genuinely Paul's intent that not to keep things in the church so everything looks good on the surface. That would be what Jesus calls a whitewashed tomb. It is handle those little things, handle those disputes. So when the big things come, your decision means something and you're protecting those people that need protected, which is what the church originally did. They went and rescued little girls from the dumps because the parents were like, I wanted a boy. They rescued disabled kids from the dumps because the parents said, malformed. They rescued Jesus, right? Woman caught in adultery. With whom? No mention of the guy. They're going to stone her. Jesus rescues the vulnerable, right? So let's be a place where the vulnerable can come and feel safe and supported. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.